Let me begin just with a brief um, perspective from the European point of view on the banking union. I think, although we're all here praising it, <clears throat> it's not something that very many wanted. I think it's something that we stumbled into as a crisis management measure. Um, and we all realize that we need it. And we're now trying to make it work. Now, switching to my Austrian capacity and standpoint, um, for us, it comes as a godsend. We are one of the countries that really did want something like the banking union because it enables banks operating out of a small country to have a level playing field in Europe and not to be constrained by the size of the, of the country that they're operating out of. Uh, and in a few moments, I'll, I'll give an example of, um, of why that's particularly important for our banks. The subject of opt-ins was mentioned. Um, again, from a European point of view, the prospect of having European Union membership and Eurozone membership and separate SSM membership, which is somewhere between Eurozone membership and full European Union membership. If I were the person who has to organize the ECB governing board meetings, it would be the worst nightmare imaginable to be preparing meetings in all these various compositions. Um, but again, from my own national interest in Austria, um, since our banks are active in 17 countries in Central, Eastern, and South Eastern Europe. And only two of those are Eurozone members. So 15 non-Eurozone members, quite a few non-EU members. Um, the supervision of, of these cross-border activities within the SSM and opt-ins would, of course, be an incredible advantage. Um, let me just, if I may, break ranks with my other panel members um, and show some slides. This shows the exposures of the banks from various different European countries towards the rest of the world. Uh, and you see the, the fifth column with the AT for Austria um, circled has a very, very large exposure in one of these regions that we've defined which is Central Eastern and Southeastern Europe. Most of the banks from other countries have much more balanced international exposures. Interestingly, the country most similar to us in this respect is Ireland, which uh, has a similarly uh, overwhelming exposure to a region which admittedly is a bit um, idiosyncratically defined as uh, US and UK. <laughs> um, but this shows that um, the Eastern European focus of Austrian banks is, is existential to their business model. To further illustrate that, this chart shows the, um, the riskiness of those markets and, and the size of the exposures that Austrian banks have in these markets. Um, and also the diversity of them. Uh, so you'll see that the, the, the biggest exposures, this is in the bubble chart on the right, uh, are to the Czech Republic, um, Slovakia, uh, Romania, which is, the, the chart by the way, what is plotted here is uh, on the vertical axis, the return on assets, and on the horizontal assets, loan loss provisions as a, as a proxy for riskiness, uh, in, in terms of credit risk at any rate. Um, the far out one is, is Ukraine. So this is quite a diverse uh, exposure. And uh, it can be seen that uh, some of these markets actually show quite attractive returns on assets, uh, like, for example, Russia. But at the same time, they are showing the kind of credit growth, the kind of, uh, of bubbling over of credit growth that was typical of uh, much of the rest of the region before 2008. And so while the banks rejoice in the, in the earnings that they can 
gain from this market. Um, our worry is, of course, that it's, uh, we've seen it all before and not all that long ago. Let me also say that this diversity is a, is a source of strength. Uh, in early 2009, there was an interview with Paul Krugman in which he made an off-the-cuff remark about Iceland, Ireland, maybe Austria next, which hit us like a tsunami in terms of public relations. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, we spent uh, a, a, a large number of months explaining to the world that this region may be statistically defined as a region, but it is very diverse in, 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 in cultural and, and, and economic and, and many other respects. And I think this chart of the, the workout of that investment in terms of you know, quite a spread of risk and return uh, does bear that out. Very briefly, the rationale for the Austrian uh, bank's business model is that the profitability level in Austria itself, in the home market, has always been very low. What you see here, these, these uh, vertical bars, the, the pale blue ones are the uh, returns in Eastern Europe, so they're the relatively high, and the um, burgundy colored ones are the consolidated returns, which are a great deal lower and of course have not recovered to anything like the pre-crisis levels. What you see here is from 2005 until uh, early this year. Uh, and the profitability is of course in spite of growing uh, credit quality problems, that's the, the continuous curves, uh, which the higher of which shows um, the, um, uh, the loan loss provision ratios not the NPL ratios, but the loan loss provision ratios, because we get them on a more timely basis um, in Eastern Europe, which have, uh, of course, skyrocketed since 2008 and uh, are perhaps leveling off, we hope. Um, this just shows again the, the, the composition of profits and the decreasing number of countries uh, from which those profits uh, are now sourced. And the temptation, of course, to really milk those, those cash cows, um, even though they are countries which are a long way away with um, perhaps not the same kind of rule of law culture that uh, you find in Central Europe uh, or Western Europe um, and, and all the attendant difficulties. An overview of the challenges of the Austrian bank's business model, I won't go into all of this because we don't have that much time, but um, just to give you the, 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 the big um, headlines, uh, on the plus side is the fact that investment banking was never that much of a feature of the Austrian uh, model. It was always a customer-facing, uh, lending-based, balance sheet-based um, model, the sort of bricks and mortar, bread and butter type of banking business, what used to be called traditional. Uh, on the problem side, you have... Um, starting from the bottom, uh, certain structural aspects to do with the ownership structure, the, the, the difficulty of raising capital, capital from the traditional owners, the core owners of the big Austrian banking groups. Uh, some of them are cooperatives and, uh, or, or savings associations um, with yeah, dif difficulties in raising capital in the markets. You have the foreign currency lending problem. That's, w the rest of the world have their real estate lending problems and we have the, current, the foreign currency lending problems. I won't go into the history of this, it's a, a, mostly an Austrian speciality uh, and, it, and we exported it, or our banks exported it to Eastern Europe. And finally, um, the exposure to Eastern Europe itself, uh, which to a great degree was funded by intra-group funding, in other words, banks lending money to their subsidiaries. And it became apparent that with growing market share, the bank's liquidity exposure to their subsidiaries, never mind their overall lending exposure, but their, their liquidity exposure uh, would be, w w could reach a, a scale which became a risk to the Republic of Austria itself, a, a tail risk to the creditworthiness of, of the, let's say, ultimate risk taker, yeah? if, you, if you still allow for moral hazard. 
Um, and this is why I'm saying that the, the growth of banks is, of course, in the, in, in the old regime, in the fragmented regime, constrained by the power of the sovereign, which is the ultimate, uh, the, the ultimate uh, risk absorber. And so, therefore, a banking union, and yes, one that includes a resolution mechanism, which takes care of the burden-sharing aspect of, uh, of any international uh, resolution, uh, would be vital to our interests. Uh, a final word on another peculiarity of, of our bank's exposure to East Europe, and, and as the result of this Krugman comment, uh, there was an international, let's say, public opinion stampede uh, on Eastern Europe in early 2009. And the IMF got involved, the European uh, Commission got involved, the EBRD got involved in trying to work out a way of calming the waters and getting a deal where all the stakeholders had uh, some positive input into keeping these uh, economies afloat, in, in protecting them from the, from the spillover from the crisis, which everybody admitted hadn't begun there. Um, and so this uh, Vienna initiative was set up in which as a, as a corollary to funding from the European Union and from the IMF, uh, there would be certain measures taken in the countries themselves and the banks active there, the foreign banks with, with subsidiaries active in these countries, making their contribution by committing themselves to maintaining certain levels of exposure and not everybody running for the exit. In a way, this was a solution to the, to the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, the, the question of not you know, somebody running for the exit and everybody following him. So everybody's staying put. And this uh, did in fact work and the uh, the, the fallout from the crisis was very much tempered by uh, this initiative. Um, however, uh, you cannot expect too much from banks' public spiritedness. The, the caption is, these new regulations will fundamentally change the way we get around them. Um, so you can't, yes, you can't, you can't expect the banks to be public spirited forever. Uh, the rules that we set for them have to be such that they can follow their natural incentives within the framework of those rules. I think that the rules that we've been talking about today go a very long way, both the micro and the macro prudential rules, go a very long way towards addressing the problems that have led to the present crisis, but we can't expect them to give us perfect safety. Thank you.